Welcome to the Growth Catalyst Show, where we believe that growth could come in many forms, professional, personal, company, sales, you name it. I'm your host, Dan Mahoney, founder of Transcendent Sales Solutions and a guide to a world of growth possibilities. I've spent my career empowering companies and their people with strategies that accelerate growth. I'm here to bring you stories of these business leaders and their trusted advisors to gain insights into their journeys and learn how they fuel their own growth. Just maybe their journey could become part of your own growth story. Are you ready? Let's grow. Welcome to the next episode of the Growth Catalyst Show. I'm so happy to have my next guest. Todd McCarty is the principal at WSI Marketing Upside. He is a chief marketing officer with over 25 years experience with Fortune 500 companies such as NCR, Cox Communications, Bell South, and Anheuser-Busch. He aims to use his experience to help small and mid-sized businesses transform marketing into a revenue driver to unlock their true potential for growth. Scott, uh, Scott, Todd, welcome to the Growth Cat of the Show. How you doing, man? I'm doing all right. It's funny. Everybody calls me Scott, man. It's no big deal. So. I don't know why. You know, and again, I always got confused too because it's J. Todd McCarty versus Todd McCarty. I think that's where I was like, I got to make sure I call him the right name. So yeah, it's all good, man. Is Todd the middle name? Is that what it is? So yeah. So the official legal name is Joseph Todd McCarty. My dad's Joe, and so they've just always called me Todd. So I've been cursed since I was a kid. You know, uh, you're like, you're like Michelle, my wife, Michelle, her real name is Jennifer, but she always went by her middle name. So uh, I got you. So, well, listen, it's good to have you on the show. I'm excited to talk to you about marketing. So you're a, you're, you're born and raised, you're a Georgia boy, right? Am I, am I, am I correct about that? So wasn't technically not born here, born in Missouri, lived there three years, been in Georgia for all but three years of my life. So I, I like to call myself a native, even though technically I'm not. Where, where in uh, Missouri? Columbia, Missouri. Columbia. Oh, yeah. Uh-huh. The Mecca of Columbia. Got it. Yeah. Got it. So, and you're a UGA grad. Go dogs. Uh, yeah, go dogs. Uh, and, and one of the things that I, you know, and I do the, when I, when I get prepared for the, my podcast, I love to do research because I always find something about the folks that I'm uh, interviewing that I didn't know. One uh-huh. thing that I... I, I oh here we go now. Yeah, dig some dirt up on me. I don't know, man. Like I, I'm worried yeah. about dirt now. Your public profile doesn't have enough dirt on it. I'd have <laughs> to go deeper. So, but no, one thing is I've noticed is you know most people you started out in marketing and you were a grad in marketing at UGA and pretty much marketing is for the most part what you've done from school into your you know through your career. Yeah, that's true. So yeah, I, I majored in advertising and I uh, got a journalism degree and then. My first job, I worked for an ad agency. And so from the ad agency, I kind of, you know, took it from there, transition into marketing, you know, that sort of thing. So, yeah, I mean, long time, long time in marketing. So tell me, you know, when you got out, and again, you started out in an ad agency, and I don't even know if those even exist anymore. Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. They do. But yeah. It's, 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 it, marketing has changed so much. And I know we'll talk a lot about that, but talk a little bit about some of your corporate careers. Cause you have some big, uh, fortune 500 names, uh, in your pedigree that got you to where you are today. So talk a little bit about some of your experiences. Maybe you did at some of those firms. Yeah. So, I mean, I started out initially, I worked for, uh, what an agency, the agency is called BBDO, which stands for Batten, Barton, Durston and Osborne, but it's owned by Omnicom and Omnicom is a big conglomerate of a bunch of agents. So I worked for, um, you know, BBDO here in Atlanta. I worked on the Delta account. So I was on that account pretty much the entire time I worked at the agency. So that was a great way to start. And then, uh, you know, I made a quick foray. I was in sales for Wired Magazine for a little bit. That's not on my... uh, Where are you now? Yeah, that's not on my, uh, you know, I don't don't post that publicly. But I, for about three months, I I jumped into sales, but decided sales just wasn't for me. Plus, I... I was interviewing with Anheuser-Busch and they put me on hold for a while. And then they said, ah, we can offer you a job now. So when you're 26 years old and Anheuser-Busch is offering you a job with two free cases of beer a month, you, you tend to want to take that, right? So hey, um, I worked for Anheuser-Busch in college and I worked on a beer truck. So I understand. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, yeah. So then I, I went to work. My old boss from BBDO asked me to come work for her at Bell South. Uh, so I worked there, Bell South, for like seven years. And then when Bell South got bought by at and I jumped to, um, I got recruited to go work for Cox. So I worked for Cox at the corporate level. Um, it was like an internal consultant. I uh, really liked Cox. Cox is a good company. Um, and then, 
you know, from there, like the economy hit, impacted like Cox and a lot of media companies pretty heavy. You got bounced around a little bit, but then, you know, ended up with NCR as like head of digital marketing for NCR. So uh, that was my last corporate gig before I made the decision to start my own company. So. And what was the, or what gave you that entrepreneur itch? Like, okay, it's, you know, it's time to stop being a corporate refugee. I'm going to be a corporate <laughs> refugee and get out and be an entrepreneur. What was, what well, was your driver? Um, so, yeah. So I, I got laid, I've been laid off five times, you know? So I, uh, in marketing, unfortunately, what I learned is I chose a very volatile career path. So um, a lot of times in marketing, it's not so much your performance. It's, you know, people just like to cut marketing when times go down, right? So, mm -hmm. uh, so unfortunately, I found myself on the wrong end of layoffs five times. And um, I guess you could say I decided to start my own business because number one, I kind of always wanted to do it. It was always in the back of my head. And then number two, um, you know, what's the definition of insanity, right? Doing the same thing over and over again and getting the same results. I just got, I got tired of, you know, working two, three year stints for, for companies and, um, you know, change in management, change in you know, direction, merger, acquisition, you know, whatever it is, right? Fruit basket turnover. I just, I got tired of it. So uh, decided to pull the trigger and do my own thing. Mm -hmm. You know, you talk, you know, if I look at marketing and as it relates to business owners, the expectations for marketing with business owners and the type of business that we work with are all over the map. Oh I yeah. Mean, oh yeah. Oh yeah. So, um, so yeah, I had a conversation yesterday with a guy who's essentially a startup business. He's, you know, he's doing it on the side and he's trying to, you know, trying to get going. He's got two investors that have pumped in a lot of money, but he's really the brains. And he, um, you know, he has big expectations for what marketing can do like quickly. Right. And I'm like, you know, he's wanting to do search engine optimization. I'm like, well, if that's what you want to do, guess what? That that's not going to impact your business tomorrow. Right. So, uh, so people, a lot of times don't understand the timing around, well, if I choose this pathway, how quickly will I get results? Or if I choose this pathway, how quickly will I get results? And so that's where I guess I like to help people is to figure out, all right, what do I do first? What do I do second? You know, mm -hmm. how do I come up with the marketing plan? Um, especially given what your budget is, because his budget is really slow, really low. And so it's it's always interesting listening to people talk about, oh, I need to do something economical. Okay, well, what's economical for you, right? Because what's economical for a $20 million company is not what's economical for a startup, mm -hmm. right? So, um, you know, it's just, it, it's always fun conversations, especially with new companies like, you know, like that, that are trying to make a big bang and expect big results, but don't have big budgets, you know? Well. So. And, and and not even the budget part, but back to that plan, what I find is that owner who's more reactionary to marketing versus proactive is like the panic, like we just got to do something. We just have to do something with no like context behind like other than we need results. But do you see that a lot? Yeah. So, I mean, I call that like I'm trying to think of the right term. Uh, don't mistake activity for achievement. Right. So I think that some business owners just let's go do stuff. Right. If we we post things on social or if we do this or do that, like if we do activities, that's going to that's going to make a difference. Well, yeah, but they got to be the right activities. Right. They've got to be the, the right activities with the right audience and the right time. I mean, just just doing a bunch of stuff isn't going to get you results. You know, um, you know, like people post on social. I mean, a lot of people post on social, but I mean, you've got. And I'm guilty of this too. So I'm, you know, so I mean, I post on social and I do it just to have a presence. But unless I invest in boosting posts or you know, trying to reach a new audience, I'm just reaching the same people over and over again, you know, um, with the posts that I put out. You know, so it's, um, you know, I, I found stuff like that is marginally effective, but everybody wants to do it, you know. So um, that's my two cents. But and and with that, so. Do you see a lot of businesses or do you help them put together those marketing plans? Because I always felt like, look, it's like a th sales and marketing are, you know, are, should go hand in hand. And how you have a successful sales organization is you start with a sales plan and a strong sales plan and strategy. It's no different in marketing, correct? No, yeah, it's no different. I mean, that's why I always try to start by doing what I call a strategy brief, right? So I, I'm a big believer in garbage in, garbage out. So 
Um, you know, I typically tell business owners when I start, look, if you're not willing to invest in some of my time to sit down with you and ask you 50 questions um, and then write all that up for you um, as the input for a plan, then I'm not going to be able to give you a good plan, right? And so I try to force people to, well, not force by the wrong word, but I, you know, I want people to sit down, answer a bunch of questions, let me write it up for them like a brief format, you know, typically people end up with a 10, 20 page document and, you know, I outline what's your target, your message, your objectives, your, you know, your close rates, your, you know, what have you done before in marketing? You know, I mean, I give you a pretty comprehensive dark document with competitive research. And, you know, after I write all that up, I mean, ideally I want people to nod their head and say, okay, Todd, you understand my business. Right. And then once, once I know that, you know, you're telling me, I understand the business and I've got, your priorities right and i understand you know what problems you're looking to fix in kind of priority order then i come back with the plan right so um but if i don't if i don't go through the exercise and you know it's garbage in garbage out right like i i'm a huge believer in getting good input yields good output and um and i try really hard to do that and and honestly like when i do that for someone essentially what i'm doing is writing their rfp so like i can you, know, you can take my documentation and go to any other marketing agency and have them give you a proposal based on my documentation, right? So, um, you know, so that's that's how I try to work with with business owners as a start to give them, you know, to pull to pull the parameters and the inputs out of their head, get it on paper, and then you know use that to develop a plan. So that's how I like to start anyway. <laughs> Do you find those business owners that say, look, that's all sounds great, but I just need more leads. All I want you to do is get me more leads. <laughs> and yeah, I mean, so there are people that say that, but I, I like to tell them, look, if I don't understand your goals and I don't understand your objectives, then, you know, how can, how can I develop a plan? Right. Cause at the end of the day, you know, a plan is really just, a, you know, strategies to plan to meet an objective. Right. So if you don't have an objective, yeah. if you don't know how many sales you're looking for, if you don't know, what your close rates are, if you don't know all those numbers, it's hard to build, you know, a plan, right? So if you need a certain number of leads to close a certain number of deals, then, you know, what are you willing to pay per lead in order to get, uh, you know, the leads in, in order to get the sales, right? And a lot of times people don't think of it that way, right? So yeah, I need more leads. Yeah. So, so in talking about leads, leads is like just the word lead. There's different types of lead. And I don't think a lot of people realize this as far as, a marketing qualified lead versus a sales accepted lead versus an actual, you know, there's different ways to look at the whole lead process. Can you just talk a little bit about that from a marketing perspective? Oh man, I wish I had my little presentation queued up. I got like a whole slide on that, right? So, uh, so I'm a huge fan of a company called Serious Decisions. Like they're now owned by Forrester, but they have this whole like lead spectrum that they outline, right? And the lead spectrum starts actually at like a level zero lead. It goes all the way up to, I think, five levels, right? So level zero is, hey, I just bought a list, right? I just went and bought a list of people and, you know, I don't they're know. All they're, they're, they're all buyers. They're all buyers. Yeah, I, I, got a, I got a list, right? So, okay, great. You got a list. So that, that's like level zero, right? Level one, and I, if I had it queued up, I'd, I'd talk about it. But like level one is... Uh, you know, someone who maybe raises their hand, right? They download a white paper, they they do something, right? So, um, you know, that's a level one. Doesn't mean they want to buy your stuff. It just means they took five seconds to click a few buttons and download something, right? Um, and I always laugh when I get phone calls from, you know, whenever I go download something, and I get a phone call from a, you know, kind of gung ho BDR, you know, hey. Hey, can I answer any questions? I'm like, no, nah, man. I just, I just wanted to download your. I just hit send 15 your, your seconds e ago, man. You know? yeah. yeah, exactly. So, um, yeah. So, you know, I think like level three might be like automation qualified or something. You know, when people take certain actions. You know, maybe level four comes in where you actually talk to them and find out. You know, do they have some some need? You know, budget authority need timing, some of that stuff, right? And then. You know, ultimately you find out, okay, yeah, they do have timing and they've got a set budget and, you know, they're looking to solve the problem by a certain time frame. And so, yeah, there's like five or six levels. I don't have a little chart in front of me, but then like, to your point, somewhere in there, you know, you get to the, you know, marketing boy inquiry kind of comes first, right? The hand raiser, right? And then, you know, how many inquiries do you need, right? How many people do you need to reach to get so many inquiries? And then how many of those inquiries are going to convert to, you know, marketing qualified leads because they actually did enough or took an action, you know, to get qualified, right? And then to your point, like the sales accepted thing, 
Um, a lot of people leave that out, but let's face it, at the end of the day, salespeople aren't going to work the lead they think are junk, right? So you might as well have them formally say, yeah, this one's garbage. Like I'm sending it back to you, right? I mean, I'd rather get feedback than, you know, keep mm -hmm. it in there. And then, you know, last but not least, yeah, the, the sales qualified, you know, turn it into an opportunity. Um, you know, that's what it's all about. And it's all about figuring out how to get that repeatable demand generation process rolling, right? Um, very elusive. So, but that's the goal. Give me leads. That's the goal. Leads, more leads. And let's take a moment for a quick word from our sponsor. This episode of the Growth Catalyst Show was brought to you by Transcendent Sales Solutions. Whether your company is facing uncertainty, declining sales, or resource limitations, Transcendent Sales has the solution. Their team has decades of experience helping businesses find alignment to meet their growth goals and transforming underperforming sales organizations into revenue producing market leaders. They take a hands-on results-oriented approach to solving sales challenges. Visit transcendentsales.com to learn more and subscribe to the bi-weekly Growth Catalyst newsletter for insightful growth strategies. Transcendent Sales Solutions, empowering businesses to reach new heights. And now back to the show. You know, and again, the what's changed, you know, the digital marketing piece has changed and it's really, and it continues to evolve and change. I mean, if you look at digital marketing, I mean, is it, is it, is the goal of digital marketing to drive social media marketing and social media presence or, or is it more to drive people to websites or is it both? I mean, I know that's a broad question, but you know, where is the really digital marketing piece really fit into that? So, so my view is that your website is like your engine, right? So you build a website that is hopefully set up to convert traffic to leads, right? That has, that follows the good principles of getting people to fill out your form or get them to call you or take whatever primary action you want people to take on your website. And, uh, but you know, if your site's not built to convert, then um, it doesn't really make sense to drive a ton of traffic to it because it's just blowing your money, right? But but I believe that like your website is your engine and you have to have a really well-built engine, but it's amazing how many people I work with want to build a really good engine, but then they don't want to put fuel in the engine, right? So the fuel in the engine is, wow, I'm going to go, um, I'm going to do some stuff on social media to drive traffic, whether that's just, you know, organic posting or paid social or whether that's Google ads or, you know, email or whatever, you know, so you can't just build the site and, you know, build the engine and expect people are going to come and I mean, I've had clients, and they will come. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've had clients where it's like, we build the website and then they just want to keep changing the website. Well, we're not getting any leads. Well, that's because you just keep rebuilding the engine, right? If you want to, if you want to just keep rebuilding the engine, we can do that. But ultimately you have to make the decision to put fuel in the engine if you want to see if it mm -hmm. runs. Right. And then that fuel is, you know, the traffic driving activities you invest in, right. The mm -hmm. you know, social Google, whatever it is, whatever floats your boat. Right. Um, and so that's uh, so that's my opinion. So digital marketing kind of serves two purposes. One is it's the engine, two it's the fuel, right? And mm -hmm. are you willing to invest in the fuel? Some people will, some people won't. So mm -hmm. some people want high octane fuel that works quick, and some people want low octane fuel that <laughs> that doesn't work so fast. So 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 a couple of things I'd love to get your opinion on things real quick. Cold calling, you know, cold call kind of marketing. Is it dead? Is it still alive? Not in my opinion. So, I mean, I, I have a cold calling guy that helps me out. I mean, um, I pay a guy, you know, a certain amount per month and with a dedicated script and a dedicated list. And, um, yeah, I mean, I source a lot of my leads from cold calling, quite frankly. Okay. All right. What about direct mail? So, I mean, I think if you have a really targeted audience, I think direct mail can be effective. I mean, I, you know, I don't think direct mail is dead either. You know, I think it's just a matter of figuring out how your audience wants to consume information. And if you have, you know, the right message, the right approach, then direct mail can be effective. I mean, you know, it also depends on the company, right? And what their goals are. I mean, so companies like Valpac, you know, shared mail, that's essentially a shared mail approach. I mean, they're still making money, you know, they're still in business, right? You still get the little blue envelope in the mail, right? So, um, so I think direct mail can be effective depending on, you know, what's your business and what are your goals mm -hmm. and all those things, right? So it just Yeah. I mean, businesses like us aren't gonna be in the value pack typically. No, exactly. So I mean, Valpack is not for your average B2B business, right? But for plumbers and 
you know, garage door guys and whatever. I mean, it works, you know, um, or at least I assume it does because I keep seeing them running in it. So mm-hmm. um, it, must, it must help. I mean, they're doing it. it. Must help. I don't open them, but it must help. But yeah, I, mean, I, I sometimes do. Yeah, I sometimes open them. I used to, because when I worked for Cox, Cox actually owned Valpac. So, uh, okay. so I, used, I used to work with, uh, I used to work with the team at Valpac a little bit. So, yeah. So, all right. So now you get to cheat. Now you get to go and, uh, and prove us and show us some of your sales skills. So tell us about WSI marketing upside and how you guys really help business owners, all small business owners, small mid-sized business owners. Mm, well, so I like to tell people I solve four problems, right? So one of those problems is, hey, I'm really confused about where to start with marketing. What should I do first, second, and third? So I, I you know, so that's that's probably the most common problem that I run into is people come to me and say, hey, I know I need leads, I know I got to do something, but I don't know what to do first. There's a million things, you know, where should I start, right? And so, you know, so I like to solve that problem in terms of, you know, I'm confused about where to start. Um, you know, another problem that I solve a lot is, Hey, I'm really frustrated because my website blows. Like it's not really a strategic part of my business. I don't really get any leads from it. How do I, you know, how do I improve my website? Um, and you know, I like to tell people, well, there's like, there's multiple types of websites, right? A lot of, a lot of businesses start off with what I call a business card website. You know, that's like a few pages that basically just shows you're legit, but really isn't built for lead gen, you know? Um, and, you know, other people have a more robust website. So I, I like to look at websites and figure out how to help improve conversion. So how do, we, how do we improve conversion? How do we improve your content? How do we help you, you know, get some traction in search engines? So fixing an fixing a, um, ineffective site, you know, is, is one area of focus. Uh, the third problem is, hey, I'm really concerned my message isn't on target. I, you know, I, I'm not really sure how, what I do is very complex and I have all these solutions that I can help people with it. How do I roll up, you know, my message across all these solutions to communicate what I do. And so, uh, so I try to help people come up with, uh, you know, the right, the right message that that's going to have an impact because if you don't clearly help, if message is a big part of marketing and, and, you know, leads. And if you don't have the right message that resonates with the audience, then, you know, you're not going to see a return. So, uh, so messaging is important. And the fourth one is, uh, hey, I'm not really sure how to measure this. Like, I know some of what I'm doing, it works, but I don't really know, you know, what. And so, hey, can you help me figure out how to measure marketing? And so on the B2B side, a lot of times, as you know, Dan, that gets back to, well, do you have a CRM system? You know, do you have a place where you're tracking, you know, closed sales and leads to the funnel and that sort of thing? Because if you're not, then, I mean, we can anecdotally look at it, but without the data, then it becomes a lot harder to, to track. Yeah. And, you know, CRM on a sales side is very underutilized. And then when I see a marketing automation tied to it, in many cases, I see it, they're not really tied as much as they should be. It's not giving all the data that should come over to the sales side. It's not giving intent data or things like that. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, when people love to jump into marketing automation, but the data is the biggest inhibitor because, if you don't have the data and if you don't take time to set up the data right, then your marketing automation platform isn't going to be a huge help because you can't go in and run segmentation on, well, I want to target all the people that bought this service or, you know, did this or, you know, so, I mean, I've worked for some clients. It's like, they just use it as a big massive Rolodex and they email people, you know, they just email everything out to everyone in the database. Whereas if you go in and spend time to actually, augment your data, segment your data, tag your personas, tag, you know, know who you're communicating with. You can just do so much of a better job of, you know, putting out the right message to the right person at the right time. And a lot of people just don't, they don't use it that way. You know, it's just a big, it's just a big Rolodex when they send everything out to everybody. Mm -hmm. Not not a best practice. So back to what we talked about is those expectations. We talked about it in the beginning of our conversation. How do you manage those expectations? And I know there's KPIs and there's going to be measurements and along the way, but it seems like marketing is, they're even more impatient about what they do or don't get out of marketing versus what they are to sales. And 
how do you how do you manage that when you're working with a client? Because in a lot of cases, what you're talking about, it's a long game. It's not like, hey, we're going to put a face back ad up or we're going to do this and we're going to get instant results and we're going to be flooded with leads. It doesn't work that way. How, right. do, how do you manage that? Um, you know, one of the things I like to tell clients is, you know, marketing is a is a I got to pull this out of my memory here. Marketing is a practice, not a profession. Right. So um, so it's all about test and try. I mean, you know, unfortunately, what works for, you know, a business out in California, you know, isn't going to work here because the the audience is different. You know, there's so many different parameters. Right. So a lot of times with marketing, you just you have to be willing to invest and test and try different things because, um, you know, Google ads may work really well for your average B2C company. But, you know, what I've seen lately is that it's not working real well for B2B companies, you know, and so you have to be willing to to test and try new things, whether that's oh, we need to do some LinkedIn advertising and go after a specific segment because they're a part of a group or something. So, you know, so I just, I try to tell people like, look, it, it takes time to test and try. And unfortunately, you know, like the doctor, you know, the first medication we recommend to help you with your blood pressure may not, may not work, right? We might have to try another medication. I mean, we might have to try a different approach. And, you know, I wish I could control you know, how many people are looking for your product at a given time and all the, you know, the, the market, but I don't, I don't control the market. So I, I can't, I can't guarantee that, you know, we're going to have instant results because there are so many factors that are out of my control. You know, I can, I can make recommendations based on what I, what I think is worth testing and trying. And if that works, then we keep rolling with it. But if it doesn't, then, you know, we test and try something else. So um, that's how I do my best to manage the expectations. So I hope that, I hope that answers your question. Absolutely. There's some great stuff you just gave and okay. So you've got some business owners here that are listening to this and, and, and they're going and they're thinking, yeah, that sounds like me. That sounds like me. What are some first steps that they could do or a few steps right off the bat? Like, okay, I've got to get on the right path. Cause I know I'm not with marketing. Any, any advice you could give them right off the bat? So, I mean, you know, one of the ways that I've really built my business is, um, you know, just honestly reviews, right? You and I have talked about this in the past, you know, Google, Google reviews are an important driver of search. And so I, you know, I try to serve clients well and, you know, try to take care of them. And at the end of an engagement, I always ask for a review and, you know, I help people and kind of give them some suggested texts and give them a link and send them a nice email that says, Hey, if you're willing to give me a review, here's how to do it. And so over the last, I put a lot of effort into it, I don't know, two, three years ago. And so now I think I'm up to like 40, 40 Google reviews. And so if someone, if someone Googles digital marketing agency near me and they're within 10 to 15 miles of my location, I'm, I'm going to pop up, you know? So um, it sounds really, I mean, that's a really simple thing to do, but, you know, reviews are just really, really important and they go to your reputation and you can repurpose those reviews. Um, you know, on your website, uh, you can repurpose those reviews and other communications. Um, but in order to get those, the first thing you have to do is have a Google My Business listing. And like, you know, the, the company that I talked to yesterday, they didn't even have a Google My Business listing. Well, how do I do that? What is that? You know, so, um, you know, a lot of people don't know that, um, you know, that basically Google gives you a free listing for your business. And it's essentially like the white pages. Remember the old white pages from 30 years ago, right? It's essentially dating um, yourself. You're yeah, dating know, yourself. Right? And, well, and yeah. young people listening to this are going to go, what's the white well, pages? What's a white pages, right? Um, <laughs> so yeah, but it's, it's essentially that, that free listing. And so many people don't take advantage of it because they don't know how, or they've never claimed their listing or they don't own it. And so sometimes I'm amazed by how many businesses and owners I come across that don't, don't understand how that works, don't have one don't know how to access it um, and just need, I mean, that's one of the basic things, right? So um, like another basic thing that I always recommend for people is if you're going to have a website, you, you sure should have analytics on it. Like you, you know, you want to have the basics like Google search console and Google analytics and tag manager. You want to have all that stuff on there. Even if you don't look at the data, you know, every day or once a month, like three years down the road, you might actually want to look at it. And if you don't have it set up, right then you don't have anything to look at. So I'm a, I'm a big believer. And if you're going to take the time to set up a website, you know, take the time to do some basic SEO setup, take the time to set up the right analytics so that, you know, two, three years down the road, if you want to see how it did, you can. You can't improve what you can't measure, 
right? And a lot of people don't take the time to put steps in place to measure. And one of the favorite tips you gave me a long time ago when you helped me look at my website is about a phone number. And that was one of the things I never knew about where your phone number should be on your website. Yeah. Yeah. So, well, I, you know, so that really goes back to conversion, right? So, you know, so there's three things people look for when they come to a website. The first thing, first question they ask themselves is, am I in the right place? You know, I'm in the right place to solve my problem. And so, a lot of people get wrapped around the axle on taglines. I think taglines for your average small to medium sized business are kind of stupid because people people just want to know what you do. They want to know what box to put you in, right? So, like you know, on your site, you know, like if you look at my career coaching site, I just have like career coaching or career upside, and then under that, you know, uh, career coaching and career and executive coaching. If you go to my WSI site, it says fractional CMO services, digital marketing agency, right? So. Um, I'm a believer in just keeping it simple and telling people what you do, you know, at the top of your site as opposed to doing taglines. Um, the second question people ask is, can I trust this company? And your phone number is like the number one trust factor. People want to know you're legit. So you have your phone number in the upper right hand corner. It does two things. It shows that you're legit. They can reach out and touch you. And when you're on a mobile device, typically it makes it easier for them to just click a button on your mobile device and, you know, uh, call you. Right. So um, other trust factors are things like the reviews and the rating testimonials and, you know, maybe logos of clients or partners or what have you. Right. And then the last thing is, what do I do here? So, um, you know, where do I go? Right. And a lot of people don't understand that color and pictures, things like that are really important because they tell the eye where to go. And so, you know, making sure that all your call to action buttons are similar color and people know you know, orange means go or whatever, you know, on your site. I mean, you know, and having what you don't know is you don't know if the person coming to your site, you know, had, you know, lost their dog or their wife left them or whatever. So you have to make your site really simple, ducks and bunnies, you know, so that people know where to go and what to click, because, you know, at the end of the day, we've got a lot of things pulling at our attention. And so you got to make it really, really easy for people. So and simple, it sounds like. And simple. Yeah, simple. Simple, keep it simple, stupid, right? That's right. I was going to say that, but I'll let you say it. That's right. So, <laughs> so Todd, uh, last last question for you. I know there's some things you've talked about here that resonate with people. What's the best way to connect with you and your team to learn about maybe more how you might be able to help them? Yeah. So, I mean, my favorite way to start with people is to just give a free assessment, which is no, you know, most marketing agencies will do that. Um, but what I, what I try to do is look at, I do three things in assessment. And if you go to my website, there's a, my WSI website, there's a big button that says book a marketing assessment, right? I, I tell you exactly what it is I want you to do when you come to my site. So three things, three questions that I try to answer when I do an assessment. Um, one is, you know, how is your website set up for conversion? You know, is, are you, are you following best practices? Because it doesn't make sense to spend a lot of money driving traffic to your site if your site isn't set up for conversion, you know? Um, number two is I try to give you a sense of where you stand in search engine. So if you're not really sure what your visibility is, and you don't know, you know, what you rank for, or you've never really thought about it, then I give you some data to help you see where you're, where you're ranked in search engines, you know? Um, and the third is if you give me four competitors, then I'll run some high level numbers and show you Here's how you stack up versus your top four competitors from a digital perspective so that you know, wow, am I behind? Am I ahead? Am I middle of the pack? You know, what do I need to do to catch up? So, uh, so those are the three questions I typically answer in a free assessment. And uh, honestly, I really like doing free assessments for people because it's just, I like to help people and give them my time. And I think eventually it comes back in the end. So, um, so I enjoy doing the free assessment. I'm always happy to talk to someone and, point them in the right direction. And if we're not a fit, you know, no hard feelings. So that's my approach. But yeah, the website, probably the best way to, to give me, if you go there and just click on the book assessment or, you know, phone call, right? My phone number's in the top right corner, you know? Um, so, and your website and phone number is? Yeah, so my, well, so the phone number is 404-219-7056. And the website, I, I, I'm not a huge fan of my website URL, but it's w s i marketing upside uh, dot com so okay. um, it's all about potential so i came up you know I, I had a business called marketing upside and then when i became a franchisee of wsi i blended you know the wsi thing in 
So now I've got uh, that's that's my that's my name. Uh, All right. Well, Todd, I, I appreciate it. your. I, I really appreciate you coming on the show and uh, you gave some great nuggets for people to listen to and appreciate it. See you up the road. And thanks for uh, coming on the Growth Cattle Show. Yeah, man, you're very welcome. Thanks for having me. All right. Thank you. And that's a wrap for today's episode of the Growth Catalyst Show. Remember, you can take these stories of growth and make them part of your own journey. Learn from them, draw inspiration, and let them guide your path of growth. I'm your host, Dan Mahoney, and I look forward to our next journey together. If you've enjoyed the show, please subscribe and leave a review. Until next time, keep growing.